Predictability isn't just a feature of the aggregate stock market and dividend yields. It's in fact a phenomenon that's pervasive across lots of markets. Um, what we've, saw, we've seen is returns on dividend yields. We added CAY and, and had a little bit of a, a view onto how that's going to change things. In fact, uh, what's going on already, a whole list of other variables. Uh, I just put in their mnemonics to give you some sense of how many there are uh, forecast stocks. And, and one thing we have to think about is, is understanding where that list uh, really begins and ends and how important these things are. But it's not just more right-hand variables, it's different markets. Uh, in individual stocks, as well as the market as a whole, uh, uh, are, they are forecastable. You can run regressions of individual stocks on variables. And in fact, um, the, the HML, the, the value and growth phenomena that we study in individual stocks, can be all represented as forecasting regressions. A stock with a high book-to-market ratio, uh, that forecasts a high return for that individual stock as well. So all of the variables we think about and all of the factors in the individual stocks are part of uh, the grand predictability, time-varying, risk-premium uh, uh, picture. The same uh, thing happens in bonds when we look at the term structure. Uh, we will see that uh, if, you, if you do the, uh, ret the um, uh, return on bonds minus the risk-free rate and run those on the, on the yield spread, one might have thought the expectations hypothesis back in the old days uh, predicted that, there, that bond returns should not be forecastable. In fact, it turns out that yield spread variables uh, forecast bond returns quite strongly, and the same 0 to 100, 100 to 0 thing uh, goes on. Some measures of the term structure, the forward spread, turn out to be entirely related to a risk premium and not at all to forecasting where interest rates are going. Uh, the same picture shows up in foreign exchange. Uh, if uh, interest rates in the euro land are 5% and in the U.S., you might say, well, fine, that means the euro will depreciate 4%. Doesn't mean you should put your money there. When you run regressions, forecasting regressions of returns uh, on different currencies, on the interest rate spreads, exact, where the ones go, the zeros go, and where the zeros should go, the ones should go. It turns out that these interest rate spreads forecast returns, risk premiums. Uh, they don't forecast changes in exchange rates, just as dividend yields forecast returns. Uh, they don't forecast uh, changes in dividends. Uh, lots of credit spreads uh, don't. Um, a credit spread is a higher yield on on uh, junk bonds versus normal bonds, or a higher bond yield over time. Credit spreads, when you run these regressions, uh, turn out in many ways to mean not higher chances of default, but instead to mean. Uh, higher expected returns. So there's a time-varying risk premium that shows up in credit spreads. There's, a, there's two coefficients that have to add up to one, and many of those times the one is the zero and, and the zero is the one. Uh, the same uh, pattern shows up in houses. This is uh, from discount rates. I, I made the plot in the regression uh, just to make this uh, fun and visible. This is rent and this is uh, house price indices. So what happens when house prices are higher than rents? Well, you might have thought that means rents are going to rise in the future. No, it turns out house prices higher than rents means prices are going to decline in the future. That's a polite way of saying what happened. And you can see this is a pattern that's happened many times. When house prices fall relative to rents, it's not rents that are going to fall, it's prices that are going to come back. In fact, I, I ran the regression. Here's the regression for houses, returns and uh, uh, rent growth on the price to rent ratio. This is stocks, returns, and dividend growth on the dividend yield. And you can see the regressions are, are almost identical. So the same phenomenon is happening in, in every market uh, that we go uh, look at it. Now that leaves us still with, with many, many questions. In each market, we're regressing returns uh, on a price from that market. We've started to think about multiple right-hand variables, but the natural question is, hey, do, do, the, do the things that forecast bond returns also forecast stock returns? Do the things that forecast stock returns also forecast bond returns? The, seeing this pervasive pattern across markets as, screams for what, what is the, the uh, cross effects. Is there a factor structure to expected returns? Are the expected returns in all these markets moving one-to-one -one with business cycles? Or to what extent are, are the markets uh, separate? Um, are the kind of models that we use to explain? Now, now we need models. 
Uh, are we going to think about correlations with business cycles or perhaps financial crisis or perhaps these things are in fact moving off their own ways, uh, the needing models of, of segmented markets or some sort of the, the, the factor structure of expected returns and the economic explanation of this thing is something we've only started to scratch the surface of and, and leaves plenty for future researchers uh, to do. Thank you.